Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Leighton Lee, and I'm the rector here. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the Cathedral Church of the Redeemer, a place for the soul and the heart of the city. The cathedral is the seat of the Anglican Bishop of Calgary, as well as a home for all Anglicans in southern Alberta. The parish itself was founded in 1884, and this present building was completed in 1905. It continues today, as it has for the last 129 years, to be a place of worship, education, and outreach, and so it is a great privilege for us to be able to host this year's Iwasa Lecture on Urban Theology. Before I introduce our host for the evening, let me deal with a few housekeeping matters. The first is that washrooms are located in the undercroft, which is a fancy Anglican word for basement. You can reach uh, these washrooms via the staircase off the north lobby, which is the smaller lobby on this uh, side, on the left-hand side. There's also a barrier-free washroom on this level, which is also accessed off that north lobby. And then you're all invited to stay for coffee, tea, and light refreshments after uh, this evening's presentation, and those will be served in the narthex, the main lobby at the rear of the cathedral. And now it's my delight to turn things over to the host, our host for the evening, Dr. Douglas Shantz. Dr. Shantz is Chair of Christian Thought in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Calgary, a position he has held since 1999. His courses at the university include spiritual autobiography in the modern age, Christianity in the developing world, medieval and reformation Christianity, and advanced studies in modern Christianity. His writing and research focus on Protestant reform movements in early modern Germany, especially German pietism. These early modern Europeans wrestled with many of the issues we face today the competing claims of the Bible, tradition, philosophy, and science. And in March of this year, Johns Hopkins University Press will uh, publish his newest book entitled An Introduction to German Pietism, Protestant Renewal at the Dawn of Modern Europe. And so we welcome him now to the podium. Thank you, Reverend Lee, and it is a pleasure for me to welcome you this evening to this very important panel on the issue of homelessness in the city of Calgary. And this remarkable audience, I think, is testimony to the timeliness of this issue. And I'm glad that you're here, uh, not just to, to listen and uh, to take in, but, but to engage. And there will be a time for, for a conversation around this very important issue. As you may know, the city of Calgary has made it a 10-year project to address this issue of homelessness in our city. We are halfway through that 10-year uh, project. And so as we are here today, we have a panel of people that I think will help us think about where we are and about where we need to be. This week is also an important week for the churches in the city of Calgary because it is the week of prayer for Christian unity. And uh, the organizers of these events have kindly included us in their program. So I'm pleased now to call Reverend Victor Kim of Grace Presbyterian Church and the president of the Calgary Council of Churches to say a bit about this week. Victor. Thanks, Doug, for the opportunity to be here tonight and to speak on behalf of the Calgary Council of Churches. I am Victor Kim, a minister at Grace Presbyterian Church and currently serving as the president of the Calgary Council of Churches. This is the first year that we've, uh, we've had an opportunity to partner with the Chair of Christian Thought uh, around this week. And I think the, the theme, I think hopefully some, most of you have got this handout. Uh, looking at you, there's probably not enough handouts for all of you that are gathered here tonight. But, uh, the theme for the week, of Christian, the week of prayer for Christian unity this year comes from the prophet Micah, what does God require of us? And I think gathering here tonight to speak about the issue of homelessness in Calgary is definitely something that God would want us to think about, to be involved with, and to be engaged at on a very, very deep level. Um, 
This year's theme was developed by Christians in India, uh, in particular around the issue of the Dalits and the whole issue of caste in India. Last night at Grace, we had Dr. Anthony Perel, who is Professor Emeritus from the University of Calgary, uh, who was born in India, and he spoke at the opening service for the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity. Tonight, we're happy to be here as part of the Chair of Christian Thought Lectures. Tomorrow night at Woodcliffe United Church, there'll be a service. Wednesday, we're at the University of Calgary, uh, and we have a service hosted by the Christian chaplains at the university at noon. Thursday night, we are at St. Mary's Cathedral, where Bishop Henry will lead us in worship on Thursday night. And Sunday, we are at Calgary Community Reformed Church. And um, this information is available um, online on our website, or you can, I think you can look it up on the Calgary Herald that was there over the weekend as well. But uh, we hope that you'll take advantage of an opportunity to worship at at least one of these opportunities, if not more, and be involved with the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity. Thank you very much. I am pleased to welcome every one of you. I'm also pleased to welcome a number of distinguished guests who are with us this evening. First, I want to welcome Deputy Mayor Gail McLeod. It's so good of you to make time in your busy schedule to be with us this evening. We'll be hearing from uh, Deputy Mayor McLeod in just a few minutes. I'm also pleased to welcome uh, President Elizabeth Cannon from University of Calgary. Uh, she has also fit this program into her schedule, and I'm grateful for that. And we'll be hearing from Dr. Cannon near the end of the program. And then finally, I would like to welcome two bishops of Calgary, uh, the new Anglican bishop, uh, Bishop Greg Kerr Wilson, and Bishop Fred Henry, who I'm sure needs no introduction, who is the Roman Catholic bishop of Calgary. Alderman Gail McLeod, and today Deputy Mayor Gail McLeod, has agreed to bring a few remarks that relate to our panel this evening. She was elected Ward 4 Alderman in 2010. She has a strong record of public service going back more than 30 years in the executive world, the business world, the banking world, and now she brings those skills to her service as Alderman in Calgary. She is strongly committed to affordable housing in this city and has contributed directly to the 10-year plan that I spoke about earlier. She has a new role as chair of the Calgary Housing Company. She is on the Calgary Homeless Foundation Committee, so she is well suited to speak to us this evening and to introduce our panel. Deputy Mayor McLeod. Well, the thing about being short is that you're either up on a pedestal or not, and I opted for the pedestal, so I apologize for being quite so tall, although you all look very good here tonight. It is indeed a pleasure to be here this evening, and I'm getting, how's that, is that better? Okay. It is great pleasure to stand here this evening as, uh, on behalf of Mayor Nancy, and in the role as both Deputy Mayor and Alderman. I have a deep personal interest in this topic of homelessness, um, not from a personal experience, but from a family experience and from people that are close to me. Knowing that there are individuals in the community who, like us at the city, are grappling with solutions, it, en it energizes me to delve deeper think harder, connect better, and, um, and, and work towards solutions in the same way as we're talking about today. So there, there are many of these conversations going on right now um, across the city, and some, sometimes in very surprising places. We're seeing business leaders, officials from other levels of government, academics, nonprofits, movers and shakers in community, and they're all talking about building the kind of Calgary we all want to live in, one that is just and inclusive, one that is built on improved quality of life, one that honors a wealth of relationships over the amassing of personal wealth. 
It seems to me the right time for such grappling because it, it is clear that together we can make a real difference in the lives of Calgarians, no matter what their walk of life. Together we can end homelessness. And if we pull back the layers just a little bit, we reveal one of the root causes, which is poverty. I'm going to let others talk about homelessness, but I am going to talk a little bit about what's going on at the municipal level. We have a 2020 sustainability initiative, a renewed interest in Imagine Calgary, the Strong Neighborhoods Initiative, Cultural Transformation Project, the Citizen Service Transformation Initiative, the Three Things for Calgary Initiative, and the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative. So thinking about it, what, what do all these have in common? They're all about people. And it is, it's all about people. Cities aren't just a network of buildings and roads. Cities aren't just a geographic, geographic complex that's plunked down in a certain space and time. Without people and all the land, without people, all the land use policies, the garbage collection, the assessment activities, the things that we do in the municipal world are meaningless. Without people, there is no reason to grow and change and hold down visions for the future. We, we are this city. And it's, it's you and it's me and it's everyone who lives here. It's we that collectively make a city. And let's face it, we are kind of messy and complicated. All cities are. Cities where, are where individuals congregate in huge numbers with diverse values, needs, and advantages. Where we bump up against each other in physical space, where we don't necessarily choose each other's company, but we need to figure out how to live together. And that is why community building is the solution to what ails us socially. And that is why 30 plus years of effort to solve homelessness and poverty with charity models have not worked. Because at its core, charity maintains an us and them division between people. Unless we own the problems as being ours and not theirs, we come away with band-aid fixes instead of sy systemic fixes. And in the end, we have done nothing or not much of anything. We, you, me, all of us, are part of the problem. And we all, therefore, must be part of the solution. And I can't emphasize that enough. We all have to take responsibility for what's going on. Let me give you an example of some of the emerging vision statements coming out of the, uh, what we call CPRI, or the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative. A strong Calgary is a city that reforms its social service delivery network so that any resident requiring services would only have to tell their story once. A vibrant Calgary is one that does business differently using internationally acclaimed models such as microfinance, social <coughs> enterprise, and cooperatives to provide financial capital to individuals who want to pull themselves and their communities out of poverty. Imagine if we scaled up what's already being done and removed some of the crazy bureaucratic barriers. An inclusive Calgary would honor our indigenous population Understanding that you, the unique history and legislated discrimination experienced by this demographic group puts them at considerable disadvantage in society. A sustainable Calgary is one that builds community-based resources using already existing physical infrastructure to bring services and amenities closer to the users or the clients. So imagine neighborhood spaces um, that are responsive to neighborhood needs, uh, using community resources. And when I think of that, I think of people, seniors, kids, effect, using them effectively in the community and using community resources that are underutilized, churches, community halls. And there's any number of things that as a group, if we come together, that we can actually do. The possibilities are endless. And perhaps more importantly, this is all very doable. If we had such services and amenities and capacity and neighborliness at the fingertips of each and every one of us, would it really matter 
what our income levels are? And does it strike you like it does me that if we could build such a city based on common values and compassion, that we would all benefit from it, not just those that we consider impoverished? If we were to accomplish this, does it, does it sing out that we aren't, at this point, we aren't really talking about homelessness and poverty anymore. We're talking about the need for community. By building a quality city where we all benefit, and here's the big idea, the big dream, that together we can solve what ails us as a, as a society, it, it, it would happen as if by accident. It would just happen. The uh, CPRI tagline is enough for all. And we do, we do have enough for everyone. The challenge for 2013 lies before us and, and, and to make all this happen. If we accept some ownership in the problem, I believe this is possible. So with this in mind, let's get to the essence of this gathering, which is to talk about homelessness. And I look forward to hearing from the panel. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy Mayor McLeod. This is the third uh, of this year's lectures in the area of Christian thought. A couple of people have expressed to me some surprise that, um, that the Chair of Christian Thought at the University of Calgary is sponsoring this event. So just let me say that it is the mandate of the Chair of Christian Thought in the Department of Religious Studies to host four annual lectures or events like this that address issues of contemporary community concern, social concern, intellectual concern uh, from a Christian perspective. And to me, it makes perfect sense that an issue like this would be on this lecture roster that I have the privilege of organizing. Let me also say that it, this is actually the Kasuo Iwasa lecture, which is also an annual, an annual endowed lecture. Uh, some of you may know that Kazi Wasa was a United Church minister in this city uh, for a number of years. He was minister of church and society at Central United Church until his death in 1982. It was just a few years later that this chair was founded, uh, thanks to the initiative of Dr. Peter Craigie at the University of Calgary. And when they were naming endowed lectures, his name obviously came to mind as a worthy person uh, for this lecture. And so it's my privilege to have organized this in his honor. I now want to introduce our distinguished panel uh, that are sitting in front of us today. Um, we have three people that I think bring unique perspectives, and my thought was, let's look at this from different points of view. And so we have uh, John Rook, who is the CEO of the Calgary Homeless Foundation, and he's going to talk about the issue of homelessness as a social problem. We have Mr. John Bodman, who, is, who himself was formerly homeless for a number of years in this city. He's going to talk about homelessness as a personal problem. And Bishop Fred Henry, who has been so involved in this city in many capacities, is going to address homelessness as a spiritual problem. John Rook has, was recently appointed uh, to the, as CEO of the Calgary Homeless Foundation. This was established, I believe, in 1998. I think I've got that right. The late Mr. Art Smith, a leading Calgary entrepreneur and philanthropist, founded the Calgary Homeless Foundation to create a united front to, ad to address homelessness in our city. As of 2008, this foundation has established its own mandate to end homelessness in Calgary in 10 years. It is the calling of, Mr. of Dr. John Rook to facilitate this. And uh, John, you've taken on a great task, and I look forward to hearing tonight what you have to say about how you will approach that task. Dr. Rook is responsible for overseeing this plan. He's responsible for implementing this vision that this city has. He comes well qualified to us today. 
He has a PhD from Oxford University. Uh, we had, we've had some distinguished lecturers here, and I usually say that if you can't be at the University of Calgary, then Oxford is not a bad place. And uh, I'm sure John would agree. John has served as the chair and president of the National Council of Welfare, uh, which meets in Ottawa from 2007 to 2012. It is an arm's length body to the federal government. He has also served as CEO of the Salvation Army Community Services Initiative, and most recently was CEO of Potential Place in this city. So John, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Gail, you should have left that thing here. Do you, do you want us to stand on that? Or can you see us OK? What, what do you think? Yes? yes? Let's do it. When I grow up, I want to be big like Doug. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. Last year, I had the privilege of being a part of this. And at that time, I did more formal um, academia, I would say, would you say? Uh, tonight I'm not. I thought I might rather, because I only have uh, 15 or 20 minutes, uh, talk a little bit different. I think uh, all of us agree that the growing social problems that result in social fragmentation and threats to public safety are both actual and perceived. So I'd like to talk a little different. I'm also conscious of the fact that we're in a church. And I might come back to that at the end if I still have some time at 10 after 8. Um, also conscious of the fact that we're in a church, I'm very aware of not only my background in biblical studies, but also my Christian upbringing. So it does feel like I'm at home in many ways. And I'm tempted to talk about things like uh, the woman who touched Jesus' garment who was a very poor and impoverished person. And after, this isn't in my notes, but uh, here we go. Um, after she was touched, what happened? She was healed. We don't have a Jesus here to heal us tonight, but uh, she was in that situation. Uh, for me, that's a fascinating story because there's a little girl in the story too. And homelessness and poverty is often about women and little girls, isn't it? In that story, and I'll just pause for a moment, um, the little girl was 12 years old. The woman had been bleeding probably from the uterus for 12 years. That's a significant number in biblical uh, time frame, isn't it? Because we know about uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. We know about 12 disciples. So 12 is a very significant number. And uh, if you want... I'll come back to your church sometime and talk some more, but that's just a tease. There's significance in those numbers, and I think I figured it out to what that is. I'm also thoughtful about um, things that happen in homeless shelters. I was, uh, I'm in them all the time, but I was in one the other day as people were picking up the mats that they had laid on for the night, and I was reminded of a man carried to Jesus on a mat, and they broke through the roof of a house and let him down into a Jesus' presence. And what was the words that were said? Take up your mat. And I was conscious again of uh, the biblical background that I have. So it's a rich heritage that I have. And I thought about Luke chapter 10, where you have the story of uh, the fellow who falls among thieves, is beaten and robbed and left to die. And at the end of that story, what's the punchline of that story? For me, it's um, go and do likewise. So translate that into our work here today. When you're conscious of a need, you must respond. And I think that's what we do as we look at the problem of homelessness and poverty in our world. As I thought about uh, homelessness as a social problem, I thought about stigma. I thought about guys like my friend John who uh, try to hide as they walk around Calgary 
and go through the malls to try to stay warm and uh, pick up bottles and so on. So I thought in my few minutes tonight that I would suggest that social issues like poverty and homelessness create policy and those policies often backfire. I want to look briefly at a few issues that affect us in Calgary. Uh, briefly, I want to talk about migration. I want to talk about the smoking ban that you have in buildings. I want to talk about bottle recycling. And I want to talk about workers' compensation. So I hope that's exactly what you thought I would talk about tonight so that I know that I'm on track. But many of these things that I've just mentioned, when policies and laws are created, they create unintended consequences. And it's actually those that I'd like you to think about as I uh, go through these copious notes that I've got in front of me tonight. Let's start with migration. How many new people have come to this city in 2012? Anybody know? Shout it out if you know. Oh, there's one right there. Uh, one came. Well, we're not exactly sure of the number, but we know a lot of people came to Calgary in 2012. There are people migrating in droves almost to this city right here. Why do they come? They come because where they're leaving, there's something wrong, and where they're coming to, they have hope and prospect of something good. So that's why we migrate, isn't it? Wherever we come from, whether it's from a reserve or from Winnipeg or St. John's, Newfoundland or somewhere in Asia, it's because something's not perfect and we want to try to grasp perfect. So to me, that's why people migrate. Now, um, our 2012 migration data could not be accurately calculated back in 2008 when this plan was developed, the 10-year plan. And oh, by the way, I want to pause and say uh, the books, did everybody get a book or almost everyone? The books um, are a gift from the Homeless Foundation written by Susan Scott, who unfortunately has the flu. So she wanted to be here to autograph books for you after, but uh, that's not uh, about to happen because of her illness. But um, I don't want to delve too far into why people migrate, but rather to make a few comments about what we can learn from history and the history of migration. There's some things that are givens. Poor people who migrate, wherever they come from, always find cities hostile. That's almost a given. Migration is often to avoid negative and to try to find positive. Hope, happiness, new place, new beginnings. And third, income is often a reason for migration. The prospect of higher wages is enticing. So if you go to Fort Mac and talk to the guys who are working on the rigs, it's because the fishing world was uh, not able to provide what they believed they could find when they got here to Alberta. Now, I like history, so let's jump back a few hundred years and look at the 17th century. Did you know that huge numbers migrated from the countryside into the cities, particularly to London in uh, 17th century England? And believe it or not, uh, people like Gail McLeod, people who were in government, saw this as a huge problem. What do you think they did? They distributed food to people. They saw it as a stopgap measure so that people wouldn't steal or even worse, die. So that sounds noble, doesn't it? And haven't we created something similar in our world with uh, food banks and, and places where people can get a meal? Because we don't want our people to die either. Now, did you know that laws were enacted to persuade people to return home, to go back to the countryside? I found laws in 1662, 1685, and 1663 that require that citizens can only receive relief if they return to their former place or to their place of birth. So if you want relief, you've got to make an exit plan. There's another law in 1697 
that was passed to require a prospective migrant to obtain a certificate from the prospective place that they wanted to go before they were allowed to go to that place. So that's really interesting. And some folks around are saying, those folks who are coming from Ontario, uh, because they're advertising in Ontario that Calgary is a great place to come for work, uh, maybe they should get a certificate from here saying you've got a job, you've got employment, and you've got a home. Now that's not going to happen, but um, there are a lot of people who come here, maybe some of you here tonight, who came without all of that in place, and you get here and there's chaos. So when I worked in the um, Salvation Army shelter, and there are a few people uh, here tonight who worked there with me, and uh, we would see people who would come expecting it to be rosy and wonderful, they would arrive here, and it's absolutely not. So um, I guess there's nothing new under the sun, is there? Because we can find that back in the 17th century. So the pur purpose of those laws was to prevent that migration and to keep people back out of the cities because there wasn't adequate work in the cities. Now, those laws stopped many families, but they didn't stop single men. And you can read in the history books about what happened when single men came into the cities and the chaos that that created because there was overcrowding and disease and food shortage and lack of unemployment, and that leads to violence and unrest and so on. And all of that you can read about in history books. Now, instead of adapting to that, they created more laws to try to manage it with laws intended to stop the migration of singles. But laws, those laws were a significant failure and led to even more violence. And even parliament became polarized on issues around uh, what to do with these folks who were coming into the city. It took a long time for politicians to figure out that the problem wasn't these people, but it was in fact their laws. Now, wouldn't that be a good thing for some of our politicians to figure out? So migration, and we have lots of people coming into Calgary, it demands a careful response. Uh, laws designed to control people's movements are likely to fail. So you have to think about other structural systems that you can put in place to deal and to adapt to who's coming. So for us, uh, there was a goal. Do you remember, Wayne, was it 11,000 homes that were projected in the 10-year plan? And 11,000 homes projected over 10 years is not even close to adequate to handle even the problem of migration, let alone who's here and not housed well today. And Gail could probably tell us how many are on the waiting list for Calgary Housing Corporation for homes right in this city. So we've got a big problem and migration certainly exacerbates it. Now I said I'd talk about a few other policies. Uh, the smoking policy. How many of you work downtown? Some? Lots? Anybody smoke downtown? Who would admit to it these days? But, you know, those people, I feel sorry for them because it's freezing cold and they now can't smoke in the building because there's a law about it, right? There's a bylaw. So they go outside and um, where do they put their butts? Tim Horton cans, right? You can, you, if you walk down the alleys and places where people smoke, you can find those tins. And I found it really fascinating to think about that as I thought about homelessness. What do most of our homeless, chronically homeless friends do, John? They smoke. Almost all of them. I only know a few who don't. There's one who doesn't. But almost all of them smoke. So um, our, our chronically homeless people who are smokers, um, they, they have what we call trap lines. Um, maybe you should describe a trap line, but um, a trap line is the route people will take after they leave the shelter as they go through to find what they need for their day. And um, Butt pickers. Butt pickers, yeah. So now uh, people know where the cans are on their trap line, and they'll go and pick up, sometimes they'll take the whole can, but they'll pick up butts from the can. So what used to be a big problem for homeless people, having to go into the gutters to try to get their butts, they can now go to the tins. And there are even people who know who the guys are who are, the, who are coming through. And before they go back inside after their smoke, 
they'll leave one or two nice ones out there so that the guy who's working the trap line can have some nice ones. So uh, that policy, that smoking policy, was done uh, for a purpose, and yet it had a completely unintended purpose. So that's a simple one. The, other, the next one I want to talk about is the bottle recycling policy. Bottle recycling uh, policy, and I talked about this uh, a little bit ago at the School of Public Policy, uh, and, and at that time I gave all the data on recycling and so on, which I won't do tonight, but um, bottle recycling was implemented for me, not for homeless guys. It was implemented for me so that I could be a responsible citizen and turn in my bottles, I'm charged for it, right, on the front end, turn in my bottles so that that didn't end up in the landfill so that um, I would be a responsible citizen and return my bottles. But what do I do? Not me, but normal citizen tosses the bottle. It's only 10 cents. So what's happened is there's an unintended consequence to the bottle recycling thing that affects homelessness. Um, that unintended consequence is it's created informal work. It's created a system where people on their trap line uh, will go and will pick bottles. I know guys who will pick till the bottle depot opens and then they'll cash in their bottles. If they've got enough for their smokes for the day or whatever else they think they need, they'll stop. If they don't have enough, they'll keep going. So that unintended consequence of that policy created unintended work, informal work. So um, one guy I know named Donnie, who used to work, live at the Center of Hope, uh, he told me that he could make 9,000 to 14,000 a year bottle picking. Now he didn't just use his for crack, he used his because he wanted to get out of Calgary. Uh, I've heard that he's in Red Deer actually, I haven't seen him for a while. So there's a huge uh, social impact to every law we pass and we need to think of the consequences and the unintended consequences. My little, I have a 10 year old, I've got 36 to 10, but my 10 year old, he loves to pick bottles. And on three Saturdays, him and his friend made over $200 picking bottles. So he was thinking about what he was gonna do with it. I know what he's gonna do with it now, but uh, they were gonna buy an iPod or something like that. But um, then they said, um, maybe we'll just give it to some homeless guys because they pick bottles anyway and it could really help them. Or maybe we could buy socks for the mustard seed. And I said, well, you guys decide what you want to do. Now, um, they've decided that they're going to save it for the college education because they think they can make more impact later by putting that money to a good use. Maybe you'll see them at the UFC someday. <laughs> kind of proud of kids like that when you, when you hear them thinking way beyond uh, their years and way beyond uh, what they do. One more thing I'll mention briefly. Uh, workers' Compensation Board. That was designed for me, right? If I get injured at work, and I'm, say, working in Fort McMurray, then what happens? I get income so that I don't lose my home, I can keep my family together, and I can exist until I'm able to get back to work. Let's suppose I'm injured at work, and it's determined that the reason was because of alcohol or a drug. What happens to me? Do I get workers' compensation? No. Do I lose my job? Yes. Will I probably lose my family? Yes. Have I been stigmatized, and will I be by community? Probably. So um, instead of making an income, I'll probably end up sleeping in a shelter, costing you people, uh, somewhere between thirteen to twenty thousand dollars a year just for my bed and food. I might have to turn to crime uh, to survive, which will cost you even more because the police are going to pick me up. I'll end up in remand, I'll go through your courts, and so on. So uh, wouldn't it be better if the policy for workers' compensation said something like, if you're um, injured at work due to an addiction, or an alcohol issue, uh, you must enter a treatment program. And it could be even on, on the work site, I don't know. 
haven't thought that through yet. But uh, if we treated alcoholism and drug addiction as an illness, we would see it quite different. Instead, we see it as a crime. So um, those are a couple of things that I wanted to mention tonight. And policies, I believe, uh, should not punish and lead to societal banishment or chaos and pain like that one does with workers' comp for people uh, who use an, uh, a drug or alcohol. And I think that working with that person uh, to solve that drug problem, to keep them employed, to keep them housed and so on, is not only humane and the moral thing to do, but it's also economically a whole bunch smarter. Now let me wrap up. Um, homelessness is a complicated social problem and I believe that one of the solutions, not the only solution, but one of the solutions is stable housing for everyone. I believe that none of us are home until all of us are home. I also believe that only providing a roof is not enough. So that's why I love Housing First, and you can read a bit about it in the book. If it offers people a chance not only to have a place, but to have a place with life supports, where you can work on education, training, mental health issues, your health issues, where people are there to assist you with the issues that will bring you to fullness and to wholeness again. And finally, I'm very conscious of the fact that we are in a cathedral. And I believe the end to homeless, in order to end homelessness, we need cathedral thinking. The concept of cathedral thinking stretches back through the centuries to medieval times when architects and stonemasons and artisans laid plans and began construction of the soaring cavernous structures that served as places of worship, community gathering spaces, and safe havens. Since then, the concept has been applied to space exploration, city planning, and other long-term goals that require decades of foresight and planning so that future generations can enjoy their full realization. Though there are many instances in which cathedral thinking can be applied, they all require the same foundation, a far-reaching vision, a well-thought-out blueprint, a shared commitment to long-term implementation. So that's what we need to solve homelessness. Let's commit to cathedral thinking. Oh, very good, John, very good. That's the point of fact. There is one perspective that is absolutely crucial to our conversation this evening, and that is the perspective of the homeless. And so I think uh, our next speaker, Mr. John Bodman, is, is an essential part of our panel this evening. Uh, John spent some 14 years on the street. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw the article I have in my hand. It comes from uh, the Calgary Journal, uh, January 2012, a year ago. And it includes the story of John Bodman. It also includes the story of his friend uh, Cecil Smith. Uh, John has been uh, off the street, as he says, on the straight and narrow for the last five years. He now works for SafeWorks, which is a harm reduction program that is a division of the Alberta Health Services. And John has a fascinating story to tell. Uh, I'm delighted, John, to invite you now to speak to us. Yeah. I need that little box, I guess. You want that? Yeah, yeah I guess I should have it. I'm no taller than John. <laughs> That's good. Oh. You have to excuse me, I just got a new hip, so I'm a little slow getting around. Uh, I don't know where to start. Um, I'm supposed to give 15 minutes, but my story can take two days. Uh, I, uh, Hello? Okay. Is that better? Okay, my um, story starts 
uh, when I was 51, I was, had my own business and everything straight as an arrow up until 51. Then I decided to be a different entrepreneur and make some money. Well, it didn't work out as well as I suspected it would work. But anyhow, um, I got into to the drug business. I'm, I'm a recovering addict and a former drug dealer. So I've been around, I know not too much about drugs, but I know a lot about crack cocaine. That was my drug of choice. That's what I did. That's what I sold. Uh, so my story starts in Prince George when I went up there to do a job, a welding job. I had my own welding truck. And the job got postponed. So I, uh, I put it, uh, so I come back to Calgary. I had some money then. So I took a, a, an apartment there and decided to wait out and sit around and see the northern country. Well, I got postponed again. So I'm there two months now, and I ran into an acquaintance of mine that I hadn't seen for years. And uh, he said, can I girl my girlfriend and I come over? And I said, sure. So they came over about 6 o'clock one night, and they said, can we smoke in your place? And I was pretty naive then, and I thought they meant cigarettes. I said, sure, everybody smokes in my place. So they bring out this little kit with pipe and all the paraphernalia in it. I thought, whoa. Oh, well, I'll let them do it anyway. By midnight come, they kept offering me all night long, but I kept refusing it. By midnight come, it looked like they were having a pretty good time. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't smoke cigarettes. I don't drink alcohol. I preach to my children all the time about dr the evils of drugs. I got a strong mind. I, I got my own business. I can do it and get away with it. Well, I took one hoot off a crack pipe, one hoot. I'm reaching in my pocket. Here's 200 bucks. Bring me some back when you come back from the dealer. It was downhill after that, all the way to the bottom. Uh, pawned everything I had. Uh, the, um, the people that I was buying the drugs with came to me, said, you shouldn't be doing drugs at your age anyway, but seeing you are, why don't you run a crack house for us? I said, I don't know anything about crack houses. They said, we'll teach you. They even have a little school there. They send a guy with you to teach you how to run a crack house. So I stayed in there for a while. And one of the reasons that you're going to have a hard time getting rid of drugs is on a bad month, after expenses and all, everything else was taken care of, we made $90,000. On a good month, we make 130. That's on a 12-hour day from 7 at night to 7 in the morning. That's just one little crack house. So you imagine the, the money that's being funneled through the system. And uh, so as it went on, I got, I stayed there for quite a while, and then I got tired and sick. So I told them I was going to a detox center. So I went to the detox center. And then I, uh, Captain Baines from Calgary, the uh, counselor that I had in the, in the detox center said, we don't want you to go back to the streets, so can anybody help you out? And I said, no, I burned everybody, and you do. They said, well, there must be somebody. I said, Captain Baines from the Salvation Army in Calgary, he might help me. And so they phoned him, and he sent me a bus ticket, and I came back to Calgary, went to the Salvation Army Rehab Center, the treatment center, which was really good after six months. You, you, when, you, when you go in there, they give, uh, I don't know what they do now, but they used to get, welfare give you $410. $200 went to the treatment center, $200 went to you to live on. So I stayed there six months, and then after I finished my treatment, got this nice little certificate that says, you're a good guy now, you can go back to society. I stepped out the door and they cut you off welfare. So I got 200 bucks in my hand. What am I going to do? I got to survive. So I'm on the phone to people I know, back to the same old thing, selling drugs, living on the streets. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a vicious circle, it goes round and round and round. And uh, you know, the social services don't help you that much. They pick you up, or the bylaw gives you these tickets for jaywalking, spitting on the sidewalk, whatever, until you get up to about $2,500 worth, then they pick you up, throw you in jail's 30 days. Wow, I'm living on the streets with nothing to eat. Now I got a bed, three meals a day. What punishment is that? Plus I make better connections. I come out of there and I got more friends that I can deal with and then that I did when I went in. So this is a real punishment. Throw me in again next month. You know? And then uh, I, I, uh, I met some real good contacts you know, that had crack houses in Forest Lawn. So I got out after my 30 days were up for the tickets. And I got off the C train at, at Enterprise, the um, welfare office up at McMahon Stadium. And I said, I don't want to do this anymore. So I went in there and I told her, the lady in there, I'll call her a lady, but I have other words for her. And she said, well, you don't have a fixed address. I said, I just told you. I just got out of jail. Spy Hill's my address. If you want Spy Hill's, Spy Hill's my address. 
So she didn't think that was very funny, so she gave me a bad time. I can give you $410 one time offer, she said. Okay, when can I pick up the check? Four o'clock. So I can't pick up the check, get the check in my hand, I'm on my way downtown, phone to my dealer, because what am I going to do with $400 in this town? I got nothing else. So back to the same cycle again, selling drugs, living under the bridges, living in the parks, living at the drop-in center. The only place I really liked was John's place, the Salvation Army. They treated me pretty good, but they kicked me out all the time. <laughs> anyway, and as time went on, um, that, that's how I got really kind of started in, and kind of finished in it. And um, before that, though, it was a real nice life. And, and you think it doesn't take a toll on you. I didn't see my daughter, and I didn't have no contact with my daughter for 13 years. 13 years, I, I wrote my whole family off. <clears throat> Excuse me, I get a little, a little bit choked when I talk about my daughter. But anyhow... When I got cleaned up, the Homeless Foundation took a chance on me. Here's this addict, drug dealer, with, you know, been on the streets for the last 13, 14 years. Don't have a hope in hell of getting a job, but I got one that old Dutch just stacking boxes. And then a, a lady, Liz McDougall, she talked to the Homeless Foundation, and they came and see me one day. And they t took a chance at me, and they gave me a job as an outreach worker, which, which I did pretty well at. I stayed there two and a half years. And then I left there and retired. And then along come Diane Nielsen. <laughs> and she took me, took a chance on me with the, with the Alberta Health Services and SafeWorks. And I worked as an outreach worker for them for a few months until my leg, my leg gave out. But uh, getting back to my daughter, uh, when I got straightened around and got myself a place, I thought, well, I'll start looking for her. So I went to the Salvation Army Family Find. And uh, in, in February... 09. I didn't hear anything until May 09, and then I got a call from Salvation Army saying, we need more information from you. So I gave them the information they wanted. They said, your daughter just, <laughs> your daughter just got off the phone. She's looking for you. 13 years. But anyway, <laughs> sorry, it just takes me a while to compose. So her and I are, we're off and on now, but we've got a pretty good relationship going at times. We still fight and argue, but at least I know where she is, and she knows where I am. And uh, that's, how, that's how it affects you. It, it takes everything, your dignity, your pride, and your lie. You can tell a lie like you wouldn't believe. And it's just the way it is. It's just a thing of survival out there. You cheat, you lie, you steal, and uh, just, to, just to survive. And that's all it is for the next hoot. You, you just spent all your money, and like John was right, you, there's nobody out there that doesn't smoke. And then talk about mental health. There isn't a person out there, and I don't care how long you've been around the town and how good you've been for 40, 50, 60 years, you go on the streets for two weeks, and you're an addict. There's no way you can get around it. It's everywhere. You're in a stairwell, you're in a shelter. It doesn't matter. There's drugs everywhere you go. And you do the drugs because it looks like the people are having a good time. And they are for five minutes, and then the money runs out, and then they're not, it's not so much fun after that. But now I've uh, cleaned up my act, and I'm working to help people get off the streets. I um, work with Diane and, and uh, do a little bit of committee work now that I can't walk around the streets anymore. And I do the same with John for the Homeless Foundation to try and help them out as much as I can. Because those are two people that are here tonight that helped me and probably have saved my life somewhere along the line. They both took a chance on me, they both believed in me, and they still do to this day. And if you don't have support, you don't make it. You really don't make it. And um, that's, that's about it. I could go on for a long time yet, but... Oh, and uh, here, here's, here's some figures for your... Not for your city government, but for your federal... for your provincial government. They took away the crack pipes from... The, from the SafeWorks giving out crack pipes. $2,500 a year, Diane and her group spend on crack pipes giving them out, which stops hep C, HIV, and a hundred other diseases. So the government comes along and says, no, you can't do that anymore. But the treatment for one person, I got this from her hep C nurse, for treatment for one person for one year is $75,000. And yet it costs them $2,500 to give out crack pipes for a year. So, you know, and they say it's enabling. It's not enabling. 
it's stopping diseases and stopping the spread. So you take away the crack pipes. You think that's going to stop people from using? You know, you go into the garbage and get an old can. You break the can open. You cut, slice the top. You put a piece of brillo in there. You smoke it out of the can. There's no way you can stop it. No way. I went to a harm reduction conference in Edmonton with Diane one time, and there's a real young doctor. She was just freshly out of med school, and I'll never forget what she said. She said, the conservative government does not believe in harm reduction. The way they look at it is, you take the airbags out of the cars going from Calgary to Edmonton, and it stops speeding. So you take a crack pipes away from the people, and it stops them from smoking crack. Well, we know how that works. So, so it's, just, it's just a vicious, vicious circle. It's a deadly, deadly thing. And I was talking to uh, these gentlemen before the thing, and I don't, I don't know how you stop it. Um, I don't think uh, legalizing is the answer, but a pound of, a pound of pure cocaine in Colombia is a dollar. Here it's thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars. So how do you, how do you stop it? You can't. It just goes on and on and on. The best I can do is go out there, and ten, tell people that uh, you know, not preach to them. Just tell them that you know you should really quit because it's not going to do you any good. Cecil, that uh, they mentioned earlier was my partner, and he overdosed two months ago and died. He overdosed because they took Oxycontin off the shelf, which he used to mix with his cocaine, and a guy came to town with some really shitty heroin, and he overdosed on the heroin and, and cocaine mixed and died right there and then. So, and I know several people that have died in the last year overdosing. So it, it's, you know, I don't, I don't know what to say about it anymore. It's just there, and it's going to be there, so we're going to have to learn to live with it. We're going to have to educate people about it. That's what I try and do. I, I go to, with, uh, to presentations with Diane and her group, and I go to the university, and I, I talk to student nurses and, and med students about drugs and, and the pitfalls of them. But that's all I can do, and the rest is up to people like yourselves to try and get the word out there that you know, it's deadly stuff. You know? Excuse me, I know a lot you don't understand what I'm talking about, but eventually you will. If you've got kids coming up, be careful, because it's everywhere. Small towns, little one-horse towns with two people in it, it's everywhere. You can't get away from it. It'll hunt you down if you don't want to hunt it down. And a high from a crack cocaine, a $20 piece will last me when I, at the, when I was at my peak, which is a long time ago, I don't even remember, would last me five, maybe ten minutes. That's it. And then you come down. So then you take it and you push your brillo all the way through and you maybe get another five minutes out of it. So 20 minutes tops for $20. And you've got to start all over again. So that's about all i got to say. I think that wraps it up pretty good. <coughs> Did I miss anything? Did I miss anything, John? Our third panelist is Bishop Fred Henry. It has been a pleasure for me to know Bishop Henry, and uh, he has been a great encouragement, specifically to me in this chair, um, in many ways. And I want to express my thanks to you, Bishop Henry. Uh, like myself, Bishop Henry is a native of Ontario, a neighboring city of London. I came from Kitchener. He became a priest on May 25, 1968. In 1971, he earned his master's degree in philosophy from the University of Notre Dame. In uh, 1973, he earned a licentiate in theology from the Gregorian University in Rome. Uh, he has spent some time in higher education. Uh, from 1973 to 86, he was associate professor of theology and philosophy at St. Peter's Seminary in London. He was ordained a bishop in 1986, and in March of 1998, he was installed as the seventh bishop of Calgary. He has filled many roles in the church and in the community. Uh, he has recently been a member of the board of directors of the Calgary Homeless Foundation. We look forward to hearing from you, Bishop Henry. Sorry. I'm grateful for the little podium because now I can see you and you can see me. 
Tonight, as I stand before you, I'm reminded of something that happened. A few years ago, we had the Global Day of Prayer throughout the world, and we featured this event also in Calgary. And on the second go-around, I was scheduled to be one of the speakers at the Full Gospel Temple on 14th Ave Southwest. And there were about 10 of us lined up to speak, and the fellow who was up before me was a black Southern Baptist preacher who was really, really well-dressed. He had on a beautiful brown suit. His shoes sparkled because of the polish. And he had French cuffs on. And he stood up to speak. And as he began to speak, he started off slowly. But then as he started to get into it, he started to really warm up and to the point where he was even beginning to perspire or in the ordinary language, sweat. And the first thing he did was took off his jacket and he gave it to one of us seated in the front row and he continued to preach and he was starting to move the people and they were amening and hallelujah all over the place. And I'm there and I'm watching this guy and then finally the tie had to come off. And the French cuffs came up and he rolled up the sleeves and he went on and on and he had all of us right in the palm of his hand. And then all of a sudden he finished, he sat down, and then the master of ceremonies started to introduce me. <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh my God, what do I do now? So I realized that th there was no way I could follow this preacher and do justice to him, so I just simply stopped and I said, before I say anything, I think we all need to take a break, and so does God. <laughs> we all need to breathe again because what he said was so powerful and overwhelming. I sat here tonight and had supper previously with John, and I thought for me to stand up now is kind of pointless because his witness, his life story, is much more powerful and meaningful than any words that I'm going to bring to you today. I'm supposed to say something about homelessness as a spiritual problem. You have seen someone work through this problem in his own life and come out as a victor, as someone who has grabbed a hold of salvation. And he is striving now to be whole, striving to be complete as God desires for him. And hopefully the past will be just a distant memory that he will be able to draw out and share to people like us to inspire us and remind us about what can happen in the lives of any individual person and how even those who are wounded and broken can be healed and restored to full health and become very productive sources of hope and inspiration for the rest of us as we continue our journey. So John, I, I just want to thank you. It was a great treat to be here to listen to you. Well, as I mentioned, I'm supposed to say something about homelessness as a spiritual problem. And I thought I might begin by just saying that about six years ago, Ruth Ramsden Wood and Brian O'Leary walked into my office at the Pastoral Center, and they said, Bishop, we would like you to join us on the Calgary Committee to End Homelessness in 10 years. I said, in 10 years? They said, yep. Yeah. I said, I'm in. They said, that's it? I said, that's it. I've never been confronted by anybody with such a vision that is so succinct and so powerful in itself that I found it absolutely irresistible. And so I became part of the committee to end homelessness. I think in some ways I was the token religious because of this, you know. 
you need a bishop around every now and then just to kind of dress every group up. <laughs> but I found that this was a wonderful experience personally and extremely challenging to see the community come together. And we had such a representation of diversity on that particular community that it enriched the overall complex enormously and led to a vision that I think continues to inspire us today. I must admit, I think it was maybe a little bit of pride in me, but I was really hoping and praying after I finished this stint of six months on this committee that I would be asked to do something more. Uh, and so I accepted gladly the opportunity to serve as the member of the board of directors for the Calgary Homeless Foundation for about four and a half years. And then I thought, well, maybe it's time now to pass the mantle on to somebody else. And so I withdrew as they were going through the last revisioning and reorganization process. But it has been a bit of, a, of an ongoing challenge and a source of inspiration to see this community tackle this and lead in such a way in not only in our city, but across our country. I don't think there's another community that has grabbed hold of the challenge and has prioritized homelessness in terms of a social reality and a problem like Calgary has. I can recall that when we started and run up to one of the elections, homelessness was about item number nine or 10. And then gradually I saw it move. And as the politicians began to campaign, it made it as high as number two in terms of the issue. I think in some sense, we have to still make it number one. It is an enormous problem. And I want to say, first of all, that it's not really a new problem. It's been here from the moment that sin entered into the world and our first parents, Adam and Eve, were expelled from the garden home that had been prepared for them. And we've been kind of homeless ever since. We read the scriptures and we find about the wanderings of the patriarchs, the exile of God's chosen people, all in search of a home. And through the lens of the sacred scriptures for those of us in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the scriptures function something like a lens. And there's a deep respect for the value of housing in relationship to the family, to intimacy, and to inviolability. And you can see this stipulation come out in a number of small ways in the law. They forced, for example, a creditor to go into the house of the debtor to exact repayment of his debt. But he was to stay outside. He wasn't to go into the house itself. This was too sacred. The debtor was to go into the house and bring out the debt to him so that it might be repaid. And the creditor could not keep the garment of the debtor because after sundown, this pledge had to be given back to the debtor for his protection. No one was to be deprived of essential goods even to ensure repayment of a debt. The loss of a place to live was, for this reason, one of the greatest misfortunes that could strike people. And whenever wars were raging in the countryside or the, or the cities, if we read the Book of Lamentations, the prophet Isaiah, or Jeremiah over and over again, we get the pathetic story of survivors being uprooted, the land of their ancestors taken from them, and being sent off into exile where they could find no place to settle down. And on the contrary, to live with one's family was to live in one's own home. And this was a constant sign of happiness and grace throughout the scriptures. Tradition even teaches us how God himself wanted his people to build him a house. 
in which he deigned to dwell and to make his name dwell there. And in God's gospel, the word made flesh is said to live, that is to dwell among us. Our final destiny in the scripture says that when we meet God after death, the concept once again of a house or a dwelling comes back into play. In my father's house, there are many rooms. It can therefore be clearly seen from our Christian religious tradition inherited from Judaism, the attribution of a very fundamental value to housing and the direct relationship between housing and family is really stressed in the charter of the rights of the family and it's presumed throughout the New Testament. Actually, the term house often signifies the family and is used interchangeably. And thus, the house of God is his family. The church of the living God is his home. The meaning of housing, when you begin to ponder this, goes well beyond purely material notions. It's a direct relationship with the characteristics of the human person at one and the same time social, affective, cultural, and religious. In each person or family lacking a basic good and above all housing, the Christian must recognize Christ himself, as well as the well-known words of Matthew's gospel, I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. And of course, to a certain degree, those last two items touch very closely on the lived reality of homelessness today. We must see in the homeless, if we are people of faith, the Lord himself, who when he came into the world, a couple of the saddest words I think recorded in scripture are, there was no place for them in the inn. There was no place for them. In the same way, the contrast that the parable of Luke's gospel establishes between the two great protagonists, the rich man who feasted sumptuously every day and Lazarus lying at his gate sets before our eyes the reality of what separates those who have housing and those who do not. We know all too well the judgment reserved for the absolute indifference of the rich man before the pressing needs of Lazarus. The situation of the two was reversed in the next world. Lazarus was comforted in the bosom of Abraham while the rich man was in torment in the midst of flames. And this was to be a lasting situation. A chasm had to be fixed so that none could cross over. Throughout his public ministry, Jesus encountered many along the road because they were homeless. And one of the things they always tried to do was to minister to them on a variety of different levels. The first level was, of course, always to reunite them with the community. I mean, he didn't talk about sin, first of all. I mean, you don't start there. You start with, once again, rebonding people and connecting them to their brothers and sisters. And so if you were marginalized, the first thing that Jesus always did was bring you back to the center and begin to suggest a connection. This is such a wonderful image because it suggests restoring the dignity of a new life to someone who has been broken and wounded and opening up to them a personal relationship with God himself. It's interesting, despite all the things I've said so far, that the scriptures really don't give us an immediate solution to the problem of homelessness. You won't find a plan there, A, B, C, D, and E. What you will do is find leading lights and lenses to look at this particular problem, and we, as the disciples of Jesus, have to imitate the Good Samaritan and figure out what to do with this person in need in front of us without considering their background, but simply who they are as a human being and seek to respond to them from the very depths of our being. 
As someone who is a member of the church, our concern for housing, I think, is very deep. And we must call not only for housing, but for decent housing. I mean, some people live in places that I could not survive in. And those places are not in accordance with their human dignity. We must provide decent and safe housing for all. And I'm absolutely convinced, as, as John has mentioned, to the housing first concept. I find it much better to say to somebody, look, we will put you in a safe and secure environment. We want to journey with you and help you deal with whatever puts you on the street in the first place, if you want it. I find that much more therapeutic and in keeping with human dignity than to say to somebody, get your act together. If you can prove to me that you're sober for six months or you're clean for three, then I will find a place for you and we will cover your rent. I think it's the wrong way to go. It's once again a kind of false paradigm of love. You measure up, you get the love. It's something like we all probably experienced at home when mom and dad said to us, okay, I want you to eat the roast beef, the potatoes, and the spinach. If you eat that, you can have dessert. I had no problem with the roast beef and the potatoes, but that darn spinach would <laughs> stick right in my throat. And yet they would say, unless you eat it, then you don't get the love, the ice cream. We frequently do the same thing over and over again to people. We say, prove that you are lovable, and then we will give you what you need, rather than giving someone what they need and saying, okay, now, let the life that is within you come forth. Live in accordance with the dignity that God created. Now, I've got all kinds of stuff here, and I know I'm way over time already, so I'm just going to close by telling you one story. Whenever I get a chance to talk about homelessness, I always tell the story, so those of you who have heard me before, you know what's coming. This is a story about a town that was just beyond the bend of a large river. And one day, the children from the town were playing beside the river, and they noticed that three bodies started floating down the river. And they ran for help from the adults, and the town folk came out, and they quickly pulled the bodies out of the river. One body was dead, so they buried it. One was alive but quite ill, so they put that person in the hospital. The third turned out to be a healthy child, so they placed that child with a family who cared for it and took the child to school. Well, something funny happened because from that day on, every day, a number of bodies came floating down the river. And every day, the people of this town would pull them out and they would tend to them, taking the sick to the hospitals, the children to put them in families and in schools, and burying the dead. Well, this went on for years. And each day brought its own quota of bodies. And the town folk not only came to expect a certain number of bodies each day, but they worked at developing more elaborate systems for picking them out of the river and tending to them. And some of the town folk, get this, became quite generous in tending to those bodies. And a few extraordinary ones gave up their jobs so that they could tend to this concern full time. And the town began to feel a certain healthy pride in its generosity. However, during all these years, despite all that generosity and all that effort, nobody thought to go up the river behind the bend, to hidden from their sight to try and find out why daily those bodies were being dumped in the river. I'm greatly concerned that we as 
citizens of this community. We've got wonderful mechanisms in place when the bodies start flowing down the river. But so few of us are taking the time to go upstream around the bend to look at the causes of why are people ending up in the river in the first place. And unless we begin to take a more serious look at the phenomenon, I think, of poverty itself, we're going to continue to have too many bodies in the river. We're going to have to solve something that is not just charity, but there's a, a systemic problem that causes a division between rich and poor, between have and have nots, and very frequently those who have not end up getting trapped, and if they don't die, they end up pretty seriously wounded in the process. I think we are challenged by society, by humanity, to build a better community, one in which no one would be without what is minimally essential for a dignified life, where no one lacks decent housing. The poor and the marginalized, I think, are waiting for a concrete answer. It's so easy to come up with policies. It's so easy to be generous and to write a check. It's so easy to applaud when we see good things going on around us. And we really have some attitude adjustments that we have to work at. Because some of our society is pretty indifferent still. Some of it's hostile to the plight of the poor. But those who are on the margins are waiting for a bold social initiative that's expressed concretely by granting them and making possible for them affordable and accessible housing coupled with easy access to all the necessary means and legal assistance and programs to deal with their addictions so that they might become whole themselves. One of the other things that we have discovered, and I ran into this in terms of our parishes, we tried to get several of our parishes committed to work with the Homeless Foundation, and we had at one time a program known as All Roads Lead Home. Because one of the things we sense that you can put somebody in a house, you can give them some of the tools they need to survive, but what you can't give them is a community. We can't integrate people. We, we can't work hard enough at this to build those networks of support so that these people all of a sudden don't drift back into a former lifestyle, but they find new life, new friends, new energy, new solidarity in terms of what we create for them. I think we can do and have to do an awful lot more on that score. Those who follow Jesus, I, I don't think for us this is an option. This is like not one of those things you can do if it happens to be your bag. Uh, I think this is such an integral part of the gospel. Uh, this becomes one of the tests of how effectively we will be disciples of the Lord. It is in a sense for us a humanitarian exercise, but it's also something that involves a commitment that comes right out of the gospel. What we have to show is, in a concrete way, God's love for those who are his children, for those who might be marginalized, for those who are poor, and in a special way, I know from my own family life, one of my brothers has uh, cerebral palsy, I realized that in our upbringing, we had to spend much more time meeting my brother's needs than, say, meeting my needs. Uh, it's almost as if those who are wounded, those who are broken, call forth more love for us, demand more love from us than those who might be reasonably strong in and of themselves. And I think that's the challenge that awaits and faces all of us as we attempt to make uh, this community of Calgary a little more human than it is today. 
and it's pretty darn good. Thank you. That was really good. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Now, you have an opportunity to join the conversation. I would just request that you keep your remarks, your questions concise. Keep them brief so as many people can be involved as possible. So we do have a roving mic, so I'd ask, we do have a question at the back. A woman is raising her hand there. Thank you. We have about 10 or 15 minutes max, so. Hi, everybody. My name is Chrislyn Olofsson. I've been in Calgary th since 2005 and have been in and out of homes. I have no addictions whatsoever. Uh, I came to Calgary with a job. I didn't know that the landlord uh, Tennessee market was quite different here. I came from Winnipeg, Manitoba. And over here, I didn't think that I would end up on the street. I've never been on the street before in my life. I ended up on the street and I had a very hard time finding a place. The problem in this city is there's no housing. Uh, I'm starting a, a nonprofit organization myself next month and I'm going to be asking people to register. Uh, I have a registration number that people can write to and donate for condominiums for people because the problem with the, the homeless uh, problem is the welfare department does not pay the rent for uh, people with addictions. If everybody wrote to the Welfare Department Ombudsman and asked that this law be implemented into Calgary's uh, welfare system, that would solve a lot of problems for people that have addictions. Um, I'm going to be focusing on people that don't have addictions because there's a need for that. Most of the people that get help with the Calgary Homeless Foundation have addictions. There's still a lot of people I was homeless on the street and was not allowed in shelters for many years, and my husband and I worked. I've been married for 10 years, and my husband and I worked, and it cost us at least $4,000 a month to live outside. We had to buy restaurant food. We couldn't buy, <laughs> sorry, we couldn't buy um, a stove or anything because the city would take all our, our camping equipment because it's illegal to camp anywhere in this city. Uh, so we ended up sleeping in uh, stairwells with crackheads and other people that had addictions and everybody thought we had addictions but thankfully we got housed about three years ago and I still have, I have a mental illness now as a result of my experience. It's called delusional disorder where I have false beliefs. I started to believe that the government is hunting people on the street because I've seen people dying on the street. I've seen them warming themselves up in BFI <laughs> garbage dumps, and uh, I've seen people get involved with gangs and get killed on the street, and um, I'm seeing a psychiatrist and a counselor for all my experiences, and um, I want to thank CUPS for getting me into housing. They got, they're the only ones that listened to me. I was on the street, and I think the director really liked me and decided to put me into housing even though I was never in the shelters. This is why I believe that they pick who gets to go in the shelters. There's a lot of people on the street. They hide in your greenhouses, your garages, the back of churches. They hide in um, houses for sale if there's a garage or a shed. That's where they stay. And they're the type of personalities that have a lot of pride. They don't want people to know they're homeless. They don't participate in what the rest of the homeless people participate downtown or in shelters or food banks or anything like that. They're usually working. And they're invisible. Uh, the Homeless Foundation, um, I don't know if they have counted them properly. I counted 4,000 last year, but in their records, there's only 1,000 something on their records. So I just want to let you know there's a society out there that is homeless and they're all going to end up being mentally ill if we don't save them first because it's like they're at war. Every day you're at war looking for your next meal, looking for your where you're going to sleep and it's a lot worse than 
than be, being in a shelter. At least in a shelter, you have a roof. You don't have to worry about someone coming up to you and shooting you when you're sleeping. You don't have to worry about the person finding out that you're in their property. You don't have to find out that you don't know if you're going to live the next day. Thank you for hearing me. Chris Lynn Olofsson. Hi. Um, my name is Kevin. <coughs> Excuse me. My name is Kevin Olenek, and I work at SATE. And I really appreciated hearing the perspectives of all three of you. Um, I think it's great that we discussed dignity. I think it's great that we discussed the need for homes. And I think it's great that we discussed a perspective of someone that's living uh, that was homeless. But um, what I didn't hear tonight, and I wanted to ask about, was the concept of education. And uh, on two levels, the first level being education opportunities for people that are homeless or on social services, and education in this risk aspect of people knowing how to handle a home. I was wondering if you guys could comment a little bit on that. Well, I think one of the things that I would want to emphasize in terms of of a response is, of course, education and community development. I think the two go so closely in hand with one another. We have not only education to do from our fellow citizens and to try to get them to think a little bit differently about the problem of homelessness, but we have to put in place and give those who are homeless the tools that they need in order to kind of find gainful employment. I think one of the places that I'm perhaps most familiar with that I, I appreciate, for example, what they're doing at, at uh, the mission. And uh, I, for example, recall, and I commended Dr. Ernie McCullough at one stage from St. Mary's University College because he decided he would do something truly unique. He decided he would go down to the mustard seed and he would offer to teach philosophy uh, to those who were residents of the mustard seed. Now, I thought, this is incredible. Who would think, except somebody like Ernie McCullough, that maybe people who are on the streets may have something to say and want to know something more about philosophy, how to think and how to consider some of the traditions that we've got in order to lift themselves up. And he was amazed at what he found and discovered down there. And now, philosophy is not the most practical subject in the world. <coughs> but what it does do is it kind of gives people a sense of, of dignity, and it begins to kind of open up to them the possibilities of knowledge and motivating them to go beyond where they are right now, to kind of open up a human mind by way of just basic fundamental education but we don't always make it very easy for people to get, and we have an awful lot of technical skills that could be easily kind of uh, leveraged. For example, John was telling me that he used to be a welder. Well, from my experience of in the business world when I was a seminarian, trying to find jobs to pay myself through, or get enough to pay my tuition and room and board, I found all kinds of welders making pretty darn good money out there. And I think we've got to make trades and those opportunities for education uh, more relevant, easier access uh, to people who want them and to encourage people uh, to make that kind of jump into seeking to enter the labor force in a productive way so that they get a sense of dignity even in their work. I think we're made to work. And unfortunately, a lot of us end up doing things we don't like doing. There are some like myself who really enjoy doing what we're doing, but I think it's part of our dignity as human beings to be able to find gainful employment, but also to be able to make a contribution to the lives of other people. Mm -hmm. And so I look out at the city here of Calgary and I say, my gosh, if we can ever make some roads, inroads in terms of affordable housing, or find a way even to assist those on Cash Corner to kind of find 
something a little more permanent than just going out there with the hope that maybe today somebody's going to need some, some muscle or whatever the case might be. We can put in place better mechanisms for education. I think we'd be better off. But I think it's a dual kind of responsibility. We've got to educate our society about the nature of homelessness. And at the same time, we've got to provide opportunities for those who are experiencing homelessness to uh, improve their educational background and confidence. Uh, could I, can I answer part of that question? <clears throat> As an ex-homeless person, when it first started up, uh, the, the, the objective was to get people off the street and into housing. With no, a lot of it didn't have any support systems in place at all. So you're putting in people in, into housing who live together on the streets, which just does not work. John will attest to that. Now with John taking over, he is bringing in support systems for these people that have been put in into the housing now. A friend of mine, for example, she was been abused since she's eight years old. I used to live with her on the street. She's 46 now. She never had a place in her house until three years ago. And we got her into one of the ho homeless foundations apartments up in Vancouver. She's doing fabulous. She never will be top-notch student or anything like that because she has too many mental problems. But she's safe, she's off the streets, and she's doing very well. I'll just add a couple things. Well, I'm okay. I've fallen <laughs> off fireplaces and that. <laughs> if you want to see me, after that. Uh, <coughs> let me say three quick things. First of all, one size doesn't fit all. So it's really critical when you go into something like uh, a home base or a pathways program that the worker, and this is what they do, they'll work with you to discover what your needs are. So if you've never turned on a stove before, then that's part of the education process that has to happen, or you might burn your place down. But if you want a philosophy uh, professor, then it's up to them to find that venue for you. So that's first thing. Uh, second thing, I believe that education is a fabulous preventative strategy to keep people from being homeless. I think other than, we've talked a lot about community and relationships, but there's three really important essentials that you need. You need good education and training, you need uh, really good health and mental health, and you need adequate income. And if you have those three things, with good friends and relationships and community, most people can figure out their own housing. Uh, the third thing I would say is, um, now I've forgotten it. <laughs> My chair is in the back, it's actually okay. Um, oh, the third thing I was gonna say is, uh, I think, and I really wanna start this on reserves, if we could do it, but I would decommodify daycare. I know I'm not supposed to be political because of my position, but we've decommodified school from kindergarten to 12. It is free. If I choose to send my kid to a private school, that's my business, but I can go from K to 12 free. Can you imagine what, it would hap what would happen if a woman with children had free or really cheap daycare in the province of Alberta? It would change all kinds of things. In Alberta, we have a gender-based uh, minimum wage. Uh, women who serve alcohol are paid less minimum wage than everybody else who gets minimum wage. So we've got some things to work on. Um, I didn't say it very eloquently, but there's some systemic things that we need to work on. So we need to look at some of those kinds of things. What should a living wage be? Can we decommodify daycare? Uh, should drug plans be free and those kinds of things. So uh, some of that I think might not answer your question, but um, I think treating people as individuals with unique needs and not trying to force everybody to take a finance program because they happen to be homeless and stuff like that. I know there are a couple of you that have your hands up. Unfortunately, the time is late. I now want to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Cannon who was appointed the 8th President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Calgary on July 1st, 2010. She holds a Bachelor of Mathematics, Bachelor of Applied Science in Math from Acadia. We'll forgive you for that. And then three degrees from the University of Calgary. 
She has served as professor and dean of engineering at the University of Calgary. She has launched as president uh, a visionary program for making us the best university we can be. I am privileged now to invite you, Elizabeth, to uh, speak to us and give words of thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Doug. It's, uh, yeah. it's a pleasure to be here. I think this has been a wonderful forum that has uh, really had some distinguished speakers and a really diverse uh, members of our community. Uh, Dr. Shantz, you've done a wonderful job with your colleagues facilitating this very important discussion, bringing the academy, the faith communities, many other important uh, institutions such as the Homeless Foundation, and many others uh, really to talk about the future of this city and as many people across this country perceive that Calgary is all great, we know that there are challenges uh, right within the borders of our community. The University of Calgary as part of our Eyes High strategy aims to be a global intellectual hub and as part of that uh, we want to engage with our communities and ensure that we are relevant to you and contributing as an institution that obviously is education as one of our foundations as well as discovery, innovation and creativity. This year's Awasa Lecture on Urban Theology, the Panel on Homelessness is a wonderful example of how our talented and accomplished students, faculty and staff have an impact well beyond our campus. We see this as our responsibility to fully engage with our community and to lead on important and challenging issues. I want to particularly thank uh, the Deputy Mayor Gail McLeod from the City of Calgary who participated early this evening and our panelists, Dr. John Rook, Mr. John Bodman and Bishop Fred Henry. I enjoyed hearing from all of you. I know that uh, your words and your perspectives really uh, provided a very rich dialogue. I also want to acknowledge that one of our alumni, Mr. Sam Coleus, has been very involved as a community leader around homelessness and also very generous around the chair for Christian thought. Uh, his vision and passion in this area is an inspiration to all of us. I know that we can uh, take away this evening a spark of insight and a measure of hope that will help move forward this issue of homelessness in our city, that we will work together and to ensure that Calgary is truly the greatest city that it can be. So thank you very much and congratulations to all involved. Thank you. And thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you to some graduate students from our department who have helped out this evening. Thank you to the Cathedral Church and Reverend Lee for your hosting. The conversation can continue. If you'd like to become aware of future events sponsored by the Chair of Christian Thought, please sign the yellow sheet at the back. Thanks for coming. <laughs>